Welcome to Columbia Lighthouse for the Blinds digital series, Where Are We Now? I am your host, Jocelyn Hunter, Senior Director of Communications at CLB. Here we are in the first quarter of 2024. CLB is off to another impactful year. Joining me today is Tony Cancelosi, CLB's President and CEO. Tony, what are some of the highlights and priorities of this year? Well, 2024 started off wonderful for us. I think the major highlight is that we're giving out more opportunities for people to reach Columbia Lighthouse. We just announced through a special grant that we just got to open up our clinic in Silver Spring for free eye exams for Montgomery County and Arlington. And we're getting a tremendous response for that. More we expand to serve the visually impaired and blind in the community, more we get the opportunity to raise more money to assist them in their needs. That was a major highlight right now. The second highlight is that coming into 2024, our government contracts, especially our Army National Guard and another contract that we have, have all been renewed for 2024. Moving forward, it's going to give us an enormous backlog of new hires to our contracts in our digital data scanning and 508. The other interesting thing is that we are now creating new partnerships, especially with uh, National Industries for the Blind. We've been selected to work with them in a mentor-protege program, assisting across the country, MPAs, under the NIB umbrella. Uh, There are more than 115 agencies. That is going to give us the opportunity to train new MPAs and give them the opportunity to uh, get better and bigger government contracts because we've been able to establish an access to accessibility training center in our Silver Spring office, which means now we've doubled the capacity for training in digital data scannings and 508 and contract closeouts. So these are the basis that we're growing with that's going to give us the opportunity to hire more people that are visually impaired and blind, which is our goal to enhance that, but also give them what I would call a sustainable contract with us to serve with some of the government contracts that we have, because we're seeing that the contracts are base plus four, that's five years, and getting renewed, that's 10 years. And so we see a good career path for them in an upward mobility. So all in all, Jocelyn, we started off the year with the free clinic, which I think is enormous for us, but more importantly, the job opportunities and the mentor-protege program. Thank you, Tony. Those are strong examples of CLB's path towards another impactful year serving the community of people who are blind or visually impaired. Our guest today is Matt Ader. Matt is certainly no stranger to CLV. He is an advisory board member and an alum of CLB services and employment. Welcome, Matt. Well, thank you, Jocelyn. Great to uh, hear the great stuff from Tony about what's going on at CLB. Thank you. Matt, tell us. How did you get introduced to CLB? Wow, it's such an interesting story. CLB back in the mid-90s was trying to venture into technology, but for the most part had been mostly teaching typing as kind of a skill in computers. And so they had reached out. There was a job opening. I applied for the job opening and was actually invited to interview the day before I got married. So not kidding, on a Friday afternoon, I'm going into D.C. to do the interview, came back home, did the rehearsal dinner, got married the next day, went on a honeymoon. This is, I know this is weird for anybody listening, before cell phones, I mean, they may have had them around, um, but it wasn't like everybody had a cell phone. And so I was on my honeymoon and I really don't know if I called in to check the status of the job or not, but during my honeymoon, I was offered the job. And so this is late July of 1996. And 
This is back when the lighthouse was on 14th and P. That just tells you how long ago this was, because nobody will remember that. Now that that whole segment is like Whole Foods and stuff. Wow, Matt, that is so special. So you always think of CLB, I'm sure, especially around your wedding anniversary. Oh, exactly. They get into July of each year, and I remember going in on the 19th of July to do that interview. It was a blessing because I was going through job challenges at the time, and so the timing just worked really perfect for me. Matt, with your vast experience at CLB, what are some of the memorable moments that you continue to hold near and dear to you to this day, aside from that life moment of your wedding? Well, there's probably a couple of things. One is that we started a technology series where we would invite vendors in and we would do we would host events in DC and originally we did them at the lighthouse in uh, 14th and P and then eventually we went down to i think it was like 14th and New York Avenue uh, pretty much across from the white house there was a SunTrust bank at the time they've obviously been purchased and it's something else now but on the top floor was this great area that it, you could host events and we did two or three events in that space where we brought in some of the leaders in assistive technology to share what's new in assistive technology. And we became a place vendors, assistive technology vendors saw us as a channel to the people of Washington, D.C. in terms of sharing what kinds of technology was available, whether they were government employees, government purchasing arms, or private employees or private purchasing companies, they all came to these events. It was kind of like a mini assistive technology conference that we would host. A couple hundred people would come and the big vendors of the time, this is all before um, Freedom Scientific. So this would have been Hunter Joyce and Ark and Stone and those types of companies would come and, and show off their technologies. So that's one moment. And then the other was moving out of P Street. Somehow we didn't have a technology department back in, I guess this would have been 2001. I was kind of the default technology department at the time. And I remember moving into 20th and L was the location, I think. And I remember spending my Christmas uh, break building computers in the lobby of that space. And then of course, we also had the downstairs where we had services being performed. So we had the training area for both computers and Braille. We had the store downstairs. Later, we added the Silver Spring that year. I remember those experiences as well. When you think of time that you spent on a job, you just remember those moments where, you know, I'm sitting back listening to a book while building computers. And I, I know this is weird to people, but we used to actually build computers with floppy disks. I know this is strange to say <laughs> that, but... It, it actually still happened because we were building Windows computers. We were installing Microsoft Office on, on floppy disks. JAWS came on a floppy disk. I mean, all of this still existed in, in 2001. Wow, what incredible history that you hold near and dear that are so meaningful for CLB. A lot of this information is new to me. You know, when I started at Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, we had moved to the 20th Street location. And I do remember the space, the technology, thanks to your success and your resourcefulness and your leadership. Thank you for all that you contributed that has had tremendous impact today. It's funny thinking about it. I loved that space we had downstairs because it was a great area to be able to provide services. And and it was so much better than P Street. I miss things about P Street. Everybody was on one floor and you could just do a lap around the building and find people. But I definitely loved and thought it was a, a smart move and, and continued a smart move that, that you guys have had to make in terms of over time to, to find locations that fit the service model. Thank you, Matt. You have continued throughout your career to have this gifting and affinity towards 
technology. Yeah, I'll say this. I use technology for myself, obviously, as someone who's blind. But what I seek out of what we do is solving the biggest problem that we have, which is employment. People who are blind or low vision, as Tony talked about the different job opportunities across CLB and the different contracts you guys are working on and stuff like that are great. And we have to continue to figure out how we can increase that employment opportunity. And technology is just one piece of it, right? And you could be working in a warehouse today and you're accessing technology. Whereas 20, 30 years ago, you weren't. Whether it's time in, time out, whether it's putting in for vacation, whether it's looking at your pay stubs or more advanced stuff like ordering food for home or something like that. Then you start looking at the advancements and it's like, how do we take and solve the problems of employment? And one is to get people the training. Two is make sure they have access to technology. And three is solving the problem of employment awareness among employers to understand that people who are blind can do jobs. We still struggle with that today. As everyone knows, there's still a bias. There's still a belief that People who are blind can only do certain types of jobs, and we need to continue to fight that battle every day. And so even though I I focus on technology and what I do every day, that is like my number one goal is to how do we solve that problem? It was about a week ago I sat in on the Synod on Aging Committee where they talked about this challenge of people who are disabled and getting employment and the challenges we're faced with. And I think it's great that they hold the hearings, but ultimately we need to solve the problem, not just by talking about it, but we got to get on the street and solve it. And it comes from places like CLB who are doing training and getting contracts to help develop people and take them from no job to a job or from a job and change their career path by, you know, earning more money. The true sound of independence unfortunately, is still a paycheck. And if you want to be independent, whether it's being able to own your own home or pay for schooling or whatever it may be, you need a paycheck to do that. And so we have to develop people's skills. We have to develop the employers and we have to make sure the right technology is available for people to be successful. Thank you, Matt. Very well said. You are continuously a strong, essential advocate for our community. And one way in which you will demonstrate the usefulness of technology across multiple sectors is your upcoming trip out West to the CSUN 24 conference. Tell us, everyone out there listening, what is the CSUN conference and what can people expect to learn from it? And for people who might not have any prior knowledge of CSUN, how does this conference, this gathering impact employment opportunities? How does it impact community engagement? CSUN stands for California State University at Northridge. It's one of the universities in the California state system. And they have a department called Center on Disability, so COD. And they've held this conference for 39 years. The conference originally was designed to show the latest in assistive technology. So you had hardware manufacturers and software companies showing off assistive technology for any disability. So it could be a Braille display. It could be a white cane being sold. It could be a screen reader technology. And whatever is the latest from these companies... And then eventually in the early 2000s, since after Section 508, which Tony talked a little bit about some of the services that CLB does in Section 508, after Section 508 was enacted, there's obviously a big push for how do we make websites and applications accessible so that people who are blind and other disabilities could use it. And then CSUN Conference started to gain traction where that was going to be more than just assistive technology. It also meant accessibility was a discussion. Over time, it kind of grew to maybe being 50% assistive technology and 50% accessibility products and services. So today, if you go, a lot of it is about is about the technology, the sessions are 
throughout the week. Our company, uh, Vespera, will have about 24 sessions during the week. When I think about the, the question you asked about jobs and, and opportunities around that, I think they're starting to move towards that side of it where they're going to they're gonna host their first, they call them birds of a feather sessions where they're going to talk about how they could do more for employment with employers and people seeking jobs, job seekers. And I think in a year or so, you could see them adding a job fair to the conference. Today, it's not really been about that. It's more about what is the technology, people promoting what they're doing, and it could be anybody from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Adobe. These are some of the vendors in the past. I don't know that all of them still do it today. In our case, the company is Vispero. We have Freedom Scientific, Optelec Enhanced Vision, and TPGI. They're all going to be doing sessions in our presentation room. And then we'll also have an exhibit hall area where a booth will be showing off the latest in technology. In our company, you know, being one of the larger assistive technology and accessibility companies, we'll have as many as 60 people there. It's a pretty large investment for our company because, as I mentioned, you could have anybody from a hotel chain to a financial institution, a bank, travel and, and in hospitality industry. They're all there learning about what's the latest in assistive technology and what's the latest in accessibility so that they can solve problems for their customers and their employees. Thank you, Matt. That was a very thorough, helpful overview of the conference, its history, where it looks like it might move forward in the future. And having those industry leaders in the room to help address these areas of improved access is really essential. Having those leaders there at the table, in the rooms, hearing from experts like you and your colleagues about how to make hotels more accessible, how to make other community spaces, gathering spaces accessible throughout this nation and beyond. It's very important. Thank you for your leadership in participating in that conference and being the voice, the advocate for people like us at Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind and people with other disabilities. Yeah, I love getting out and talking to mainstream tech industries, you know, and having people like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and those kind of organizations participate in these things. Again, I'm not sure that all of them do it this year, but, you know, having that in the past has been key. And getting out and talking to these industries has been also very important. So in the last year, I've spoken at AWS reInvent. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. It's their big cloud platform. Speaking about accessibility at that conference, speaking at the National Restaurant Association show, recently participated in the National Retail Federation show, Consumer Electronics show, or they've they've rebranded it as CES, which is the big show in Vegas every January where they show off the latest in technology. And getting out and speaking at these locations allows you to reach another level of community. And we need more and more to be able to bridge that gap and not just speak at and participate in accessibility or assistive technology conferences, because we need to reach that other side that does the employment, that builds the technology. And so that's a that's a key thing that I focus on every year. Thank you, Matt. You have well communicated how your professionalism and your personal history really continue to intersect with CLB. And you are, again, a, a very strong example of CLB's mission and this full circle moment from the time you interviewed and were hired to begin your career within the technology space, starting here at CLB to your successful profession today. Congratulations. Thank you. Tony, thank you. And Matt. Thank you, Jocelyn. Joining us today. Thank you all for listening in to this latest episode of Columbia Lighthouse for the Blinds, Where Are We Now? 
please keep connected with CLB. Join us online at clb.org and check us out on social media. Thank you.